everyone. We're at a school up near Birmingham, and as you can probably hear, the kids are all out at lunch. But um, Will has just sectioned up some flint for me. He's napped it into these, or quartered it into these lovely big tablets, and I thought I'd nap an axe for you while we're on lunch and um, see if any other useful bits emerge as well. So I've still got my old trusty hammer stone. This one's been going for quite a while now, and I'll be gutted when it croaks because it's my favourite. So, problem we've got is this edge is really thick. I need to reduce that. Um, I can do a certain amount of that just by getting rid of big bits like that. Lovely big flakes. Coming off. There we go. And that's already got rid of some of the bulk. But then I can also just take one more off there. I can also start by facing it. So doing that at that angle has given me a, a striking platform here which can help reduce some of the bulk here and start to give it that kind of uh, leaf shaped cross section, lens shaped cross section that I'm after. They call that like a cortex backed knife, a cortical backed knife. But now I can strike there. It's a bit of a tricky aim. Getting at the right angle, there was a bump in the way. So you can see we're already starting to get a bit of an edge down here. It's very coarse and zigzaggy at the moment, but the overall thing is quite nice and flat. worked myself into a bit of a corner there. It's too um, obtuse an angle to hit. So unless I can get it right on that point. There we go. Not quite what I wanted, but that's better than nothing. And I'm going to come round this other side now. I'll leave most of that edge alone because it's actually really nice as it is. And Hand axes are really, really effective tools. They're, they're really wonderful things. Um, they were used by several species and they, they all had different styles of them. There were the ovate ones, there were the Mysterian ones, there were the Ficron ones. Um, but basically they all do the same job. They are for dismantling big animals. And as soon as we start, um, as soon as people like us arrive, um, we invent slightly daintier, smaller tools that require less raw material. But for over a million years, hand axes of one sort or another um, were a staple tool. And they're brilliant. Okay, so it's still pretty, um, pretty coarse. We've got some not quite edges. We've got a bit of a step fracture here, which is a bit of a pain. Um, and the edge zigzags around a lot, but that's not a problem. We can refine that. So I'm going to keep hold of this for abrading the edges and pick up my 
favourite hammer. Now the thing with antler is that it takes off, uh, because it's a bit more elastic, it takes off longer, thinner flakes. It's not going to behave as I want it. Let's take that off there. Really nice long thin flakes as opposed to fairly chunky flakes which which can end up making the, uh, the bit of stone get smaller a bit quicker than we want. So you can hear they're starting to sound more tinkly and glass-like when they drop now because they're thinner and uh, more fragile. And the thing with flint mapping is you, you sometimes have to think two or three stages ahead. So for instance, if, um, if I want to get rid of this step, obviously I need to hit it that way to take a flake off underneath and, and get rid of this, this lump. Or I could attack it from the other side here, which I might end up doing, take some of this off at once. But if I want to, to get at this, this angle is too steep. That flake has got to get... Um, climb too much of a slope to get up to this problem. So what I need to do is hit it there, which then gives me a nice place to hit that way to take that off. So I've got to think two or three stages ahead all the time. So um, that's one of the reasons why people kind of get confused and end up just like, aimlessly hitting it. But it's also where it's kind of hard to learn until you understand the, the sort of logic of what you're trying to achieve. So this bit has got to go first because that being there is going to make it very hard to hit the correct bit of this. So I'm going to have to hit that bit there. And if I'm lucky that may get rid of some of this. I don't think it has but it could do. It's a really nice piece. I'll keep that aside for something. Okay. Now, because I'm trying to take off quite a big piece here, I'm going to abrade the edge, which makes it stronger. Um, I think I explained in one of the other videos that you know it's kind of like if you wanted to push a car along, you uh, you don't push on a wing mirror, you push on the bumper or a strong bit. There we go, it's taken some of that away but perfect. So you can see there how that has taken all of that off rid of that problem. So I've got to finish quickly now because it sounds like the children have gone in from lunch. By facing a hand axe like this is, is very similar to by facing an arrowhead. You're just doing it with larger amounts of force and, and you're dealing with a bigger chunk of raw material. But if you could buy face an axe, then you, you do understand the logic of how to make an arrowhead. Um, and so, although hand axes maybe aren't as elegant, um, learning to make them does help your napping overall, I find. Because at the end of the day, it's all the same material whether you're dealing with it on a big scale or a really tiny delicate scale, it is just the same stuff as a lovely plate there. And you see, even though I'm hitting it downwards, the flake is actually going that way. Um, and that's because of the sort of weird crystal structure of flint where the, the, the hit doesn't spread out in a, in a line or a column, it goes in a cone. So if I hit it here, part of the shockwave is actually going that way. 
um, and it's going to follow the surface of the flint as much as it can, as long as I've got my angles right. It's a lovely flake there. That's an absolutely perfect flake for uh, making arrowheads. It's very thin, it's got a lovely cross section already. Perfect. At the moment, this is a little bit big for an ordinary person to use comfortably, so I've just tried to make it a little bit more friendly. fracture there. There's a bit of a weird bump here so I'm going to try and shot of that. It's a lovely blade like off. See we're pretty much there. I'm just going to make the pointy end a bit more pointy and uh, sort out the, the butt end a bit maybe blunt it. Make it easier to hold. There we go. It's got a bit of a curve to it, but in some ways that can be useful in, in, uh, in use. It's held in the hand like that. You've got an edge for slicing and a nice point for picking apart joints. I'm just going to make that a bit sharper. It doesn't want to be too thin or it's too delicate. I'm pleased with that. We're about to be set upon by children, so before they arrive, I'm just going to show you this in use. Okay. So this is a, an unfortunate road victim that we uh, picked up on the way here. take the bit of spine out. See, it's chopping through those ribs really effectively. It's just ploughing through them. Allowing us to basically take a whole section away at once. This is not the best way of butchering a deer, starting from this side. 
but you can see how effectively that's gone through there. And if I want to slice meat off, I can use that saw edge and as you can see it's wicked sharp and actually the serrations help to cut through the, um, the sort of fibrous nature of the meat as well. So there we go, a Paleolithic butchery tool.